Welcome back to Gouch Hard. This is episode 3 of my series on South Korean Golden Age Cinema. In episode 1, we looked at how the Korean War affected the South Korean film industry. In episode 2, we watched further developments amid the turmoil of the late 1950s and early 1960s. If you want to catch up on those episodes, and I recommend that you should, click the link up top. We start this episode in 1961, after General Park Chung-hee had taken control of South Korea in a military coup. Park called himself a revolutionary, but he was a revolutionary against the revolution. He crushed the trade unions and student movement and built up the military and the kaibals. He wanted to make South Korea self-sufficient and rich, no matter the cost to human life. The Kaibals were key to achieving that. A type of family-run corporation, Kaibals first emerged after the Korean War. Many are now household names in the West, like Three Stars, aka Samsung. Park subsidised the Kaibals, and in return, they became agents of his economic agenda. In effect, they were another wing of the government. Park first tried this approach with the film industry between 1961 and 1967. South Korean bombers soar over North Korea. Out of nowhere, an enemy fighter intercepts them. A dogfight ensues. The jets dodge and weave through the clouds. A dizzying point of view shot. Then a hail of gunfire. The enemy fighter explodes. The stuff of a thousand war films. And yet, in South Korea, this film was revolutionary. A revolution in special effects. A young woman runs down a department store escalator. She's in fear of her life, but we can't see what's following her. As if enchanted, the escalator comes to life, takes her back to where she came from. An atmosphere of dread in a familiar location. A feeling that modern life had turned against the individual. This too was a revolutionary film. A revolution in art cinema. This episode will link the two revolutions in film to the transformation of South Korea in the 1960s. You might think that directors would take centre stage in this story. Someone like Shin Sang-ok, the most iconic director of the 1960s. Shin was important, but so was Park, a politician who understood the allure of cinema. South Korea's history under an authoritarian regime is often glossed over. It's time to revisit that history and understand the role of cinema in it. We'll even learn something about the South Korean cinema of today and of the future. With that in mind, let me welcome you once again to the Golden Age. The history of South Korean cinema is a history of houses. Take this film. Bong Joon-ho's Parasite. A poor young man has arrived in a wealthy suburb. The houses look impenetrable. Inside the house, everything's modern, like a high-tech facility. On the wall, all smiles. Dad's a tech millionaire. He can afford this luxury. But something's amiss. The young man's family all take jobs in the house. 
they discover a hidden floor built to withstand a nuclear attack. There's yet another family living there, off of leftovers from the rich family above. Parallel lives, the wealthy living on top of the poor. Parasite used the home as a metaphor for inequality in South Korea. Now let's rewind through six decades of South Korean cinema. Parasite looks mild compared to this film of 1960, The Housemaid. The director was Kim Ki-young, nicknamed Mr. Monster by critics of the time. He made intense erotic thrillers. The housemaid was the best of the lot. We're in a fancy new house. Domestic bliss. But the husband has adultery on his mind. At first he's interested in the girl in the middle of this shot. The girl on the right is her friend, a rough type from the countryside, who takes a job as the family housemaid. She seems backwards, ill at ease in a modern home. But in a matter of days, the housemaid turns the place upside down. She has an affair with the husband, clings to him, would rather die than share him with his wife. In this scene, she's murdered one of the man's children. He tries to get rid of her, but his wife, cradling the child, wants to keep up appearances. He'll lose his job and she'll lose the house if there's a scandal. Like Parasite, the housemaid was about status. The staircase, where so much of the action happened, was a status symbol. Few Koreans could afford two storeys on their house. Those who could were in the small but growing middle class. Kim was using the house to talk about class division in South Korea. The housemaid was a clear influence on Bong Joon-ho. If the history of South Korean cinema is a history of houses, what house defines cinema in the park era? This one does. Cheonghwa Day, aka the Blue House. Park's official home from 1963 to 1979. Here's the main complex where the government met. In these rooms, Park and his ministers talked about restructuring the film industry. And here's the presidential apartment. This is where Park watched films, one of his favourite ways to unwind. He particularly liked films set during the colonial era. They ended up influencing his own policies and rhetoric. So it was what went on in a real house not a fictional one, that defined South Korean cinema during the Park era. Park's first intervention in the film industry was the motion picture law. The law forced producers to professionalise and industrialise. They could only make films if they owned facilities of a certain size, 
they had to own a certain number of cameras and lighting rigs, and they had to contract a certain number of permanent cast and crew. The law favoured a handful of producers who were already established. It made them very rich, like the Hollywood moguls of the 30s. That didn't mean they could do what they liked, though. Filmmakers also had to submit to censorship by the Ministry of Public Information. This was a quid pro quo with the film industry. Park later did the same thing with the Kaiballs. But in the first years of his rule, he needed voters, not businessmen, on his side. He'd overturned a weak government, but that didn't mean he was strong. Far from it. The economy was in trouble. The Americans were unsure of him. To shore up his position, he used cinema to win over the masses. This film, Rice, and others like it, offered an upbeat vision of South Korea under Park's rule. They were expansive, much less domestic than the films before it. Cinema matched Park's ambitions for South Korea. Rice is about an engineering project. It transforms a rural village almost like a miracle. Such projects were central to Park's economic policy. That policy was called the Miracle on the Han River. So Korean cinema got bigger in the mid 60s. But more reactionary too. It became propaganda for an authoritarian regime. Who made these reactionary films? This man did. His name was Shin Sang-ok. He was Park's favourite and the most successful Korean filmmaker of the 1960s. Critics and admirers alike called him the emperor of Korean film. Mr Shin travelled to Hong Kong and later appeared in North Korea. Shin was enigmatic, aloof. You get a sense of that in this press conference from 1986. But somehow he had the popular touch. In the 1950s, he made a run of hit melodramas. They starred this actress, Choi Yun hee Choi was also Shin's wife. Choi was one of the icons of Korean cinema during the 1960s. She was the very image of virtue and sincerity. A nation struggling out of poverty took her to heart. In the early 1960s, Shin expanded his production company. He made extravagant costume dramas like this one, Shion Chung Hyang, one of the first Korean colour films. Then, under Park, Shin became rich and powerful. He used his ties with the regime to make bigger and more spectacular films. Despite that, one critic complained that his work missed a certain clear something. Shin himself mused that his films lacked the thick scent of life. For Shin, Filmmaking wasn't a means of self-expression. It was an end in itself. At this press conference, he sat next to Choi, now his ex-wife. He talked about working for the North Koreans. Shin wasn't a communist, but he defected to the North because they gave him money and resources to make movies. It was the same reason he worked for Park in the golden age of the 1960s. Shin the opportunist. The partnership between Shin and Park began shortly after the coup of 1961. 
Park broke down in tears while watching this film of Shin's, Evergreen Tree. Set during the Japanese occupation of Korea, it tells us a lot about why Shin became Park's favourite filmmaker. Here we are in the Korean countryside. It could be 1940 or it could be 1840. The march of time has stalled here. Shin was moving away from melodrama with its anxiety about the modern age towards an epic style. He shot in Cinemascope, filmed Choi against the hills and valleys. Evergreen Tree emphasised Korea's natural beauty. Choi plays a teacher, come to build a new school for country folk. They're puzzled by her appearance. She smiles at them, struggles on. The theme of the film was self-sufficiency. It chimed with Park's vision of an independent, strong South Korea. No doubt these scenes reminded him of his own spell as a rural school teacher. Perhaps it also reminded him of the world he left behind when he joined the Japanese army in 1942. Self-sufficiency went hand in hand with self-sacrifice. Later in the film, Choi lies on her deathbed. She's given her all to build the school and raise the country folk out of ignorance. So her body dies, but her spirit lives on. It lives on in the evergreen tree. Shin overlays Choi's face on it. The sort of image you might associate with propaganda. Evergreen Tree was the first true film of the Park era. It became the model for his new village policy in the 1970s. Through struggle, sacrifice and some techniques learned from the Japanese, Park would raise the country out of poverty. And cinema was now linked with that transformation. From the house to the street, this is Chungmaro in central Seoul. In South Korea, Chungmaro stands for cinema, like Hollywood does in the US. Nowadays, most of the film industry is in Gangnam, on the other side of the Han River. But the mystique of Chungmaro lingers on. It belongs to the 60s, to the height of the Golden Age. To the time when General Park took 100 movie studios and consolidated them into six mega studios. With big studios came big talent. These were the years of Choi Yun Hee, of Shin Young Kyun, and of Shin Song Il. They all appeared in huge box office hits, exported across Asia and even to the West. <laughs> Chung Maro was glamorous, but also corrupt, like one of Shin Song Il's films. That was a consequence of Park's motion picture law. The law forced studios to register with the regime if they wanted to make films. They were then expected to make a certain number each year. To fill their quota, they employed unregistered producers working under fake names. The unregistered producers were paid with licenses to import lucrative foreign films. None of it was legal, but for a few years, Park turned a blind eye. Where it counted, the studios supported his policies. They had to. Registration forced them to. Their support took the form of propaganda. 
There were two kinds of propaganda, hard and soft. This is the hard kind, produced in-house by the government. A kind of music video. It celebrated the industrialisation of Korea under Park. As propaganda, it was obvious. Nothing more than an advert for the regime, with a jaunty tune to match. The studios took care of soft propaganda, which was more subtle and insidious. For example, Shin's film Rice didn't mention Park, but it did tie in with the message of his 1963 election campaign. To win a proper term in office, Park had to convince enough voters that the military coup had been a success. And so, at the end of Rice, the army comes to the rescue. They're bringing food and tools for this community of poor farmers. The scene's shot like a newsreel, fiction merging with reality. Soft and hard propaganda. And it worked. Park deployed mobile screening units to play the film in far-flung rural communities. Those voters ended up giving him the edge on election night. For services rendered, Park gave Shin a loan to buy a massive studio complex on the outskirts of Seoul. Shin's ambitions were as grand as Park's, and with the help of the regime, his films grew bigger if not better. In 1964, Shin directed this film, Red Scarf, about rookie pilots during the Korean War. It was a tour de force of action, explosions, weapons of mass destruction. Park loaned Shin the fighter jets used in the film. The jets had cameras mounted on them to capture exciting aerial footage. The feeling of speed and scale was new in Korean cinema. It was like Top Gun, years before Top Gun. What else was new about Red Scarf? The past was new, or rather, the way the film depicted it. In historical movies, the bad guys used to be the Japanese. Red Scarf changed that, so communists were the villains. Here they are, a faceless horde, wiped out by heroic South Korean pilots. This went over well in anti-communist Taiwan and Hong Kong. The film even made money in Japan. With Red Scarf, Shin became an international filmmaker. His career went supersonic. The release of Red Scarf in Japan marked a momentous change. Park was pro-Japan and wanted them to fund his industrial revolution. Here he is, signing the Normalisation Treaty in 1965, a controversial move. As we see here, there were widespread demonstrations against the treaty. Nerves were still raw, after decades of colonial rule. How did movie studios respond to the tensions? By begging Park for trade links with Japan. They wanted to import Japanese films, like this one, The Mud Spattered Pure Heart, a youth movie full of glamour and violence. 
with a hero like James Dean. Gundo. But the censorship of Japanese content, started in the 1950s, remained in effect, so producers had to bend the rules. They smuggled Japanese screenplays into South Korea. Then, they remade them, without crediting the original filmmakers. So, the mud-spattered pure heart turned into barefoot youth. Black and white. Filmed in mid-shot. But telling the same story with the same glamour and violence. It was a huge hit in South Korea, another break from the domestic cinema of the 1950s. Despite breaching copyright law, remakes like this weren't frowned upon by audiences. They were just as popular as original Korean films. In 1965, however, a remake came along that changed all that. The source material was this film from Japan, Daydream. It was the first major pink film. The setting was a dental clinic that transformed into an erotic wonderland. Phallic objects, an overflowing mouth, the eyes of a voyeur. Everything was suggestive. What happened to the film in South Korea, a more conservative country? The daydream became an empty dream, the name of the remake. It was an important moment in the golden age. Like the Japanese film, we're in a dentist's office. The same voyeurism too. But the Korean version ended up going in a different direction. The difference between the two films was the vision of the director. Yu Hyun Mok. Here is Yu on the set of one of his later films, watching a take. Yu was a left winger and intellectual. His version of the film was political rather than sexual. We can see that in the dental clinic sequence as he directed it. The Japanese version was erotic. Here, by contrast, the scraper turns into a circular saw. The needle becomes a pneumatic drill on a construction site. This was topical. Korea was industrialising. Park had ordered the Kaibals to build factories, then mobilised workers into them. At the same time, he cracked down on trade unions. People were treated like machines, something that you wanted to talk about. Remaking Daydream allowed you to critique South Korea under Park, but it also gave Park an opportunity. Yu was targeted by the regime. This scene was the pretext. A young woman fights with the villain. He steps in her dress, and for a few seconds, it looks like she's naked. In fact, the actress was wearing a body stocking, but the regime accused you of pornography and, worse, working for North Korea. His trial lasted 18 months. The jury acquitted him of espionage, but not of obscenity. Afterwards, cinemas pulled an empty dream from distribution. For years, it was thought to be a lost film. And then, in the 21st century, a damaged print of the film turned up, missing a soundtrack in the final reel. The Korean Film Archive added everything you hear now. Voices, sound effects, music.
내가 이 여자를 죽였어요. 내가 이 여자를 죽였어요. 나를 살인해. It was a wonderful rescue job of a film scarred by censorship. Yu and Shin represented two approaches in the film industry during Park's first term in office. Shin collaborated with the regime, Yu defied it. But the cost of defiance could be life imprisonment. So other directors charted a third course. They made artistic films that stayed within the limits set by the regime. These were the festival films. Here's one festival film, The Burning Valley, directed by Kim Soo Young. This was propaganda of a different kind to Shin's films. The Burning Valley was artistic, had depth. Like other festival films, it targeted an international audience at Cannes, at Venice. Park hoped to launder South Korea's reputation in the world by showing it could make serious films. A certain number of festival films came out each year. The Burning Valley was typical in that it was exotic and universal at the same time. The exotic was this setting, a bamboo forest surrounding a village high in the hills. It's World War II, and the men have all gone to fight, either against or for the Japanese. These women, left behind, almost merge into the trees. Local colour like this helped Korean films stand out from the crowd. Here's the universal. Sex. This man is on the run from the Japanese. He's hiding out near the village. The woman discovered him, agreed to help him, then used him for sex. Complicated gender politics, like the European films of the time. International audiences might not understand the cultural context, but they understood sex. And they understood violence. The film ends in flames. The women watch enemy troops destroy the village in order to smoke out the gorilla. The long shot captures the height of the smoke and the hopelessness of the women. There is an ambivalence about war very different to Red Scarf. But the villains were Japanese. That was in keeping with the traditions of South Korean cinema. The Burning Valley didn't set fire to the old. It combined it with the new. That was exactly the image of South Korea that Park wanted to sell to the world. The mid-60s in Chungmaro was exciting. Respectable festival films mingled with macho action and historical epics. For the filmmakers who worked on these streets, it was a golden age. They had more money than ever and the chance to reach new audiences abroad. South Korean cinema was no longer domestic, it was international. 
But at the heart of it all was the Park regime and its authoritarian control over the film industry. And now we're on to the second Fast forward to 2023. Park's long dead. Korean films are bigger than ever. They look very different to the ones he enjoyed. And the bustling excitement from this film, Parasite, criticised capitalism, like Yu Hee and Mok's films did. But unlike Yu, Bong is the respectable face of Korean cinema. So a lot has changed since the 1960s, but not everything. Park's legacy lingers on, like a bad smell. We can catch a whiff of it on other popular Korean films. Take this one, The Admiral, Roaring Currents. The most successful Korean film ever. This is the story of one of Korea's greatest heroes, Yi Soon Sin. Here he's facing down the massive Japanese fleet. The odds are against him. An impossible number of ships are heading his way. His commanders want to retreat. Yi goes into battle anyway. The film was nationalistic, pitting South Korea against a much larger foe. There were shades of Red Scarf. And like Shin's film, Roaring Currents was a visual spectacle. The battle sequences feature state-of-the-art CGI, created by an effects house in Seoul. They added to the film's appeal. But the real reason for the film's success was found in the first 30 seconds of it. Here. This is the title card for CJ Entertainment, one of the largest kaiballs in the Korean film industry. It funded Roaring Currents. It also owned the cinemas that showed it. Vertical integration reduced the risk that the film would flop at the box office. Park's support of the kaiballs continues to affect South Korean culture and society. Park himself has become the subject of several films. One of them caused a censorship scandal, like An Empty Dream did. That film, The President's Last Bang, appeared as Korean cinema enters another golden age. Old Boy and Memories of Murder had explored controversial territory and were huge hits. There was an appetite for transgressive cinema. It was hard to get more transgressive than this film. In it, Park was a lecherous drunk, more interested in chasing young women than running South Korea. He was distant from the public, rarely left the Blue House. and his death scene was deadpan. He barely reacts to the gunshot. It's a pathetic end for this narcissist authoritarian. The president's last bang was a highly accomplished and richly deserved character assassination. Unsurprisingly, Park's family were furious about the film. They sued the producers and were awarded damages for the attack on Park's reputation. The incident revealed something about the legacy of his rule. Censorship, one of the weapons he'd used in the 60s, was still potent in the hands of his children. Nearly 50 years on, the House of Park still dominated South Korea. Park's influence on South Korean culture and society is clear. But a mystery remains. His revolution in film was successful for a few years, 
South Korean films were internationally successful at festivals and they made a lot of money at the box office. What had once been a domestic industry became ambitious, global in outlook. Why is it then that so many Korean films from this period are forgotten about, almost lost? How did it come to pass that Shin sang ok the emperor of Korean film, found himself out of money, out of work, and out of South Korea altogether? And what were Park's reasons for ditching the film industry at the beginning of the 1970s? All will be revealed in the final devastating episode of South Korean Golden Age Cinema. That should drop later this year. Until then, don't forget to like and subscribe down below. And if you think anyone else would enjoy this video, please share it with them. Thank you for watching, and remember, support your local multiplex.